If you were to go Google the best high dividend stocks out there, you're probably gonna see a list of companies pop up over and over again in different articles, different blog posts, different videos. And one of those companies is Energy Transfer. This is a company that I have never personally taken a deep dive in. I've never really looked into this company. I know that it's an MLP. I know that it you know, is in the transportation and the midstream pipeline business but I've never actually done a deep dive on this stock. And my dad actually has been holding this company for years. He always tells me to make a video on energy transfer. It's a great stock. And it's one of his largest positions that he owns in his retirement accounts. And so I thought it was about time that I did a little bit of research on the company. And I came across this article on Seeking Alpha from Ray Marolo. And the article is titled Energy Transfer Value Hiding in Plain Sight. And so I read the article. There's some things that I like about the article. It is very clear, more focused on the financials. It's more focused on the different companies in this space. It's not a deep dive in what the company does. It's more focused on the financial metrics. So if you've never heard about an MLP or energy transfer, this video may not be the most informative in terms of helping you understand what it is. It's better if you already know what an MLP is in energy transfer. So energy transfer, it's just to catch everybody up if you're not quite sure what it is. It is a master limited partnership. It's a company that it's it's taxed differently it's viewed differently by the you know the way that the company is structured it, instead of shareholders you have unit holders and instead of owning shares you own units because you're a partner in this business when you own units of this company you're paid a distribution not a dividend a distribution they're very similar but different especially how they're taxed and so you're seen as a partner not as a shareholder so there's some different nuances and, and things to consider if you're investing into a company like this and it is a midstream pipeline company and so that's just a broad overview of what it's important to understand when you're investing into a company like this these pipeline companies you're not investing into oil per se but rather Rather, you're investing in the transportation of oil. Okay, does that make sense? So you're not investing in like Chevron, right? You're investing into the company that transports the oil, right? And so I've had many of these conversations with my dad on him trying to help me understand what this company does because this is not a stock that I've, I've invested in and I don't know every ins, you know, the ins and out of it. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to read this article. So let's take a look at the article and let's see what Ray has to say. So he starts off the article here with the summary that in recent years, energy transfers management has aligned the company's operational and financial performance comparably to industry peers. Debt leverage, EBITDA growth, and the cash distribution yield are on par or superior to competitors. Energy transfer isn't taking business risk beyond those the entire peer group faces. Despite comparable fundamentals and strategies, energy transfer trades at a significantly lower EV or enterprise value to EBITDA multiple than peers, suggesting undervaluation and the probability for future multiple expansion. Energy transfer common units represent a unique value proposition hiding in plain sight. So you notice that he's, he mentioned peers a handful of times. So this is very, very much an article focused on comparing energy transfer to its peers in the industry. Okay. And looking at their fi financial metrics. So this is a very, very nerdy article. So if you're watching this video, my hat goes off to you. You are absolutely a nerd and you get excited about this stuff because uh, this is, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the financials of energy transfer and its peers. So he starts off the article saying here that generally I'm hesitant to be constructive on cyclical energy stocks trading around a five year high. However, after breaking it down, I suspect energy transfer partners or ET may be an exception to the rule. Let's investigate an energy transfer investment thesis. So over the past several years, energy transfer has transitioned in its management style and financial results on both counts. Investors are enjoying steady performance. Now I'm not at all suggesting ET senior leadership change their spots completely, but co-CEOs Tom Long and Mackie McRae 
appear to have tamed the beast a bit. When recent data is compared with peers, energy transfer stacks up quite well. Investors will find that the sound debt leverage and stable investment grade credit rating, a solid EBITDA growth, a superior cash distribution yield, and a middle of the fairway forward narrative. If this is true, then ET units should command valuation multiples uh, commensurate with peers. Nonetheless, we find energy transfer ranks towards the bottom of the EV to EBITDA crowd, several turns below the following industry peers, so EPD, Enterprise Product Partners, Kinder Morgan, KMI, and Oniak uh, uh, OKE, and Williams Companies, and MPLX. At the core, my current investment thesis rests upon the foundation that if energy transfer walks and talks like its peers, then the common units at some point in the future should trade at a comparable valuation multiple to the same to those same peers. What's standing in the way? I contend it's investor sentiment. Yes, sentiment can take a long time to play out. However, concurrent with the aforementioned, I believe that, that over time, with very few exceptions, stock prices follow earnings and cash flow. Let's do some homework. So, so taking a look at the debt leverage and credit rating, a weak balance sheet used to be a problem for energy transfer. Several years ago, major credit rating agencies gave ET management a get this fixed or else memo. Subsequ uh, subsequently, management did get the memo and straightened out the balance sheet. It's now aligned with peers. The data set below seeks to make a broad cut. The objective to demonstrate energy transfer compares favorably with larger peers. Here's a chart highlighting debt to equity for a number of midstream players. So these are the, the different competitors or peers in its space. And the debt to equity is actually in the uh, in a better range than other companies, right, on this list. So it's comparable to like an MPLX, though EPD is much better than uh, energy transfer. When looking at the, the metric debt to equity, right? And so energy transfer compares favorably with MLPX and Williams, Williams companies, enterprise product and Oniac and Kinder Morgan enjoy lower ratios. Lower ratios mean better, right? Debt to equity. And then here's another chart highlighting debt to EBITDA. Debt to EBITDA is uh, is also a very good metric. It's understanding, you know, how much debt they have and how their earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization are, are going to cover those. In the pipeline space, debt to EBITDA is the general benchmark. Enterprise, Williams, and MPLX lead the pack with somewhat lower ratios. Energy transfer, Kinder Morgan, and Oniac are second tier. Next, please see the table below, and it shows the current S&P 500 credit rating for energy transfer and large peers. So they get a credit rating of triple B, which is, which is pretty good. All companies have an investment grade of triple B rating except EPD. EPD has an A- minus credit rating, so that's better. So now looking at EBITDA growth, typically midstream pipeline companies consider the financial coin of the realm to be distributed cash flow and adjusted EBITDA. In the table below, I selected adjusted EBITDA as the proxy by which to, uh, to compare energy transfer versus peers. I recommend taking a moment to look through the figures and eyeball them for yourself. So energy transfer has, now we're looking at EBITDA growth, uh, they have from 2023 to 2024, 12%. 12% EBITDA growth is is great, right? And the the only one be out beating it is Oniac. So yeah, they're they're doing very well when it comes to EBITDA growth. They're growing, they're growing their their earnings, right? So that's that's good. Sands Oniac Energy Transfer leads peers with expectations of year-over-year 12% adjusted EBITDA bump. Notably, in September 2023, Oniac completed a merger with Magellan Midstream Partners. This resulted in a modest 2023 to 2022 EBITDA uplift and materially higher year-over-year -year expectations for 2024. So they had a, a merger, and that's why they, they have higher EBITDA growth for, for Oniac. So, okay, that makes sense. So now looking at the high cash distribution yield. So distribution is the, the dividend here, right? In the third quarter, 2020, energy transfer management halved analyzed cash distribution. So in other words, they cut the dividend. Unfortunately, despite the decision coming 
coming in the midst of a pandemic of the pandemic fears, the reduction traumatized some investors. After the cut, management promised to rebuild the distribution. Indeed, by the end of 2022, the distribution doubled and is uh, and was equivalent to the pre-pandemic $1.22 payout per unit. The beginning uh, in 2023, energy transfer management increased the annualized distribution by a penny each quarter. Yeah, so when you cut the dividend, uh, especially a company like this, where the majority of your investor base is there for the distribution, the income, and when you break that trust, it's very, very difficult because a lot of people who own a company like this rely on the income. They're not there for the growth of the share price. That's just gravy on top. They're there for the income. And it's always it was kind of similar to like your grandma having AT&T in her retirement. And then when AT&T got cut, the majority of people that were relying on AT&T for the dividend, they, they threw it out, right? They threw it out the window. And that's just how you have to look at this. And you have to understand when a dividend stock cuts its dividend, there's usually no mercy in, in most cases. Very few companies who end up cutting their dividend end up turning it around. And uh, it just leaves a, a bad taste in many investors' mouth. That's why I was talking about the investor sentiment, because when you cut the dividend, investor sentiment is changed forever, okay? There's really just no getting around it. And so, yeah, just important to understand that. And the current cash distribution yield for energy transfer is larger than industry peers at 7.85% at the time of this article. Uh, constructive forward narrative. The company's recent operational financial results, coupled with renewed management focus, indicate energy transfer may be considered more of an industry stalwart. So the current business focus includes the following attributes. Opportunistic bolt-on acquisitions, higher return organic growth projects emphasizing LPG and NGLs, lower overall CapEx spend, and a corresponding run for higher EBITDA growth and free cash flow. Cash distributions analyze increases of 3% to 5%. That's actually really good. 3 to 5% is, is not bad for a company like this. Modest unit repurchases beginning in 2024. So yeah, they're focusing on shareholder value, repurchasing shares, growing EBITDA, uh, you know, increasing the distribution yield, growing through acquisition, efficiency, all really, really good things if you're a shareholder of this company or to be precise, a unit holder of this company. There are no obvious business risks in the current business model that separate energy transfer from large peers. I believe the old KW factor that tra that is so traumatized past ET investors isn't really much of a factor anymore. Please let me be clear, Kelsey Warren still has a great deal of influence on the company. His personal fortune is invested in energy transfer. Mr. Warren remains a strong-willed owner and investor. Nevertheless, I would be surprised to see today's energy transfer management team take on difficult financial operational or business development risks, nor do I believe the current management team is likely to misjudge the political PR environment in which they operate. So this uh, KW, so I'm not an insider of ET. I don't invest in the ET, but this KW factor, it sounds like if you're an, you know, you are a shareholder, unit holder of this company, that the Kelsey Warren <laughs> factor, I guess that's a thing. When you when you when he says it like that, I'm sure that there's some history with this guy here. So looking at the summary here, we have compared energy transfer versus a relevant peer group. Here's the bottom line: energy transfer's debt leverage, as measured by debt to equity and raw debt to EBITDA, appears middle of the pack. Meanwhile, the current investment grade credit rating is on par with all peers. Sands uh, Enterprise Product Partners stands two grades higher than the rest. Growth as measured by adjusted EBITDA indicates energy transfer is on top of its class with the exception of ONIAC. ONIAC however, OKE recently completed a merger with Magell uh, Megalin Midstream Partners, thereby increasing year-over-year -year results significantly. In addition, bringing a beginning in 2023, ONIAC updated its adjusted EBITDA calculation to include adjusted EBITDA. Okay, okay, okay. To be fair, in, 20, in July 2024, energy transfer completed an acquisition of WTG Midstream. However, the magnitude of an EBITDA impact of this acquisition is smaller than the Oni. Okay, this is a really, really big disclaimer of the exception with Oniac. Okay, like, all right, I, I appreciate the uh, the thoroughness of of the uh, the author here, 
but that's a little bit <laughs> like a huge paragraph for the, ex you know, to make sure that you got the whole picture. I, I actually appreciate that. So he's not really, he's not cherry picking some things. He's giving some context. So I, I like that. When compared with large peers, energy transfer units offer investors the highest current cash dividend yield. Energy transfers operations and business strategies appears well positioned and comparable to large peers. High risk controversial propositions are not part of the current management equation, there are no obvious enterprise risks facing energy transfer that other similarly situated companies do not face too. Multiple expansion, now we, we cut to the chase. Given the aforementioned understanding of energy transfer fundamentals versus peers, it calls to question unit valuation. While should energy transfers common units trade at a materially lower valuation multiple than industry peers? In the past, I could come up with various reasons that could begin to explain neutral to negative investor sentiment. It's getting harder to do now. The degree of separation between energy transfer business and peers doesn't appear so wide anymore. One may argue plausibly energy transfer's unique span, scope, and diversified energy transportation business may make it safer than some others. I think the, uh, I haven't looked at all the other companies if they cut their dividend during the pandemic, but that dividend cut, that has a long lasting negative impact on investor sentiment. There's just no getting around it. It's gonna, it could take decades and you're still gonna have people you know, sour about the dividend cut. So just, just be aware of that or the distribution cut. Yes, there still is a difference between energy transfers return on invested capital versus the pure group. I cover this in detail in my most recent enterprise transfer uh, article. You can check it out here. However, energy transfers management now obtains returns exceeding the cost of capital. Return on investment capital is improving steadily. The gap between energy transfer returns and peers does appear enough to warrant the wide differentiation in valuation multiples. Please review the following chart. This is the EV to EBITDA that he was referencing earlier. They do have a lower EV to EBITDA. Please notice I selected a valuation comparison using EV to EBITDA. Yes, there are a number of ways to evaluate valuation for security. Midstream pipeline companies are no exception. Nevertheless, over the years, I've run through various valuation methodologies for energy transfer. I've currently landed upon EV to EBITDA being one of the most reliable. Why? Using EV to EBITDA includes rounded financial inputs. EV includes market capitalization, debt, and cash. Enterprise value is based upon what the company what a company is worth if purchased by a third party. EV includes market capitalization, which may be driven by fundamentals, sentiment, or a combination thereof. It also includes debt and preferred stock, thereby rounding out the equation. EBITDA, while not my favorite financial metric, is a rough proxy for cash earnings. Back to focusing upon valuation multiples. On a trailing basis, energy transfer has an EV to EBITDA multiple of about eight times. The large peers command a valuation multiple that averages 11 and a half times. Three and a half turns seems too large. I find little to differentiate energy transfer from large peers to justify that kind of valuation gap. What if energy transfer enjoyed an EV to EBITDA multiple comparable to peers? First parameters are in order. Input data was taken from the second quarter 2024 earnings release and related 10Q. Several adjustments were in order. Non-recourse third-party debt was subtracted. Input EBITDA was the midpoint management's current full year 2024 guidance, specifically 15.4 billion. Coming units outstanding were increased by 51 million to reflect the WTG midstream acquisition completed in July of last year. The table below offers a range of unit valuation. So this is based off of the, uh, the valuation, the EV to EBITDA. If they were to have a multiple expansion up to their peers, right? You would then assume a an increase in their their unit price, the valuation of the company, right? So that's this is no different than the the way that you would look at this, like a price to earnings ratio, right? What is the the valuation of the company? And so he's arguing that EV to EBITDA is the right way to look at this you know, and comparing it to the peers in, you know, in their space. So currently enterprise transfer units are bid at $16 and 30 cents. Am I saying energy transfer units are now worth 22 to $31? No, what I'm saying is energy transfer common units appear undervalued versus large peers by several valuation turns, a considerable margin. If energy transfer maintains a comparable balance sheet, meets or beats others EBITDA growth, pays increasing cash dividends and management plays growth capital down the middle of the fairway, then it seems probably 
solvable at the same, at some point, energy transfer should see valuation multiple expansion. In the meantime, I have no objection to tending a 7.85% cash distribution yield. Currently, I believe an A times EV to EBITDA multiple on an estimated 24 adjusted EBITDA is a reasonable fair value estimate benchmark that suggests energy transfer units may have a fair value of around $18. What do you think? I look forward to reading and replying to all your all of your relevant comments below. All right, so that's the article. Let's take a look at some of the comments. All right, so let's take a look at the first comment here. Over the course of the year, the distribution should increase to $1.32. And if unit price increases to $18.50, gives us a forward yield of 7.1% moving in line with EPD. I would take that all day long. Yeah, a 7% forward yield and you're getting, you know, a 3 to 5% increase in that distribution, I think is is not not a bad, not a bad gig. So I, I like it. Another comment here, I agree, irrational investor sentiment is the only thing keeping this at depressed multiples. Not much one can, can do besides build a position and wait for rationality to prevail. Just don't hold your breath. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of investors will say, you know, will look at a stock and say, hey, this is irrational based off of the information that they have. The market is going to do what the market does. And I, I believe in efficient markets. I, I think, you know, if a company is trading at a discount or lower than its peers, it's probably for a good reason. And that reason may be more than what's just readily available on financial statements. And a lot of people will just read the, the financial statements and say, hey, you know, this is this. So by default, it means this, right? There's a lot of things under the hood. You don't know what's going on internally at the company. You don't know what their competitors are doing. You don't know if they're, they had a moat and that moat is deteriorating. You don't know if their TAM is, is decreasing, increasing. You don't know what the, the M&A activity is going to look like in the future. You don't know what the political landscape is going to look like. And, you know, investors are placing their bets you know, well in advance before the event even takes place. And so don't be so quick to label something irrational just because you don't see it on the surface or in financial statements. So that's just my opinion, but uh, something to keep you grounded and understand when you're investing into single stocks, it's, yeah, you have access to information, but generally stocks are a leading indicator. They're trading based off of future cash flows and there might be something coming across the mountain here where you don't see it, but maybe the market sees it or maybe someone sees it, you know? So you just, you just don't know. So don't be so quick to say something is irrational and whether it is irrational or not in the case of energy transfer, just as a rule of thumb, it's important to understand that. Another comment here, it is amazing the dividend cut is still being talked about like it's last month. I don't believe management style has materially changed. They took risks up front and enjoyed the results today. Yeah, that dividend cut, we talked a little bit about it. You know, when a company cuts its dividend, it's it really is very, very difficult for that company to recover from that. I mean, I still talk about companies that cut their dividend during the great financial crisis in 08 and 09, right? And some of the companies that cut their dividend during that time period, I still today won't even touch. And it really comes down to, you know, when the facts change, the facts change. And some companies recover, some companies don't, but they're going to have to, you know, battle that that negative stigma or that negative negative investor sentiment with the dividend cut. And it is great that the distribution has recovered, but it's important to understand that investors don't forget. OK, and you shouldn't either. And during the next crisis, there's always going to be that question. Well, they cut it before. Will they cut it again? And investors are, are very slow to forget that. And they should be very slow to forget that if you're relying on the income, especially for those investors who generally are investing into this type of business, they are relying on the income and not so much the, the share price appreciation. Well, that's the article. I would give this article a B. And the reason why is it does what it's intended to do. The article is focused on the peer group of energy transfer and how these companies in their in its peers are valued. And the article delivers very well on that. It goes into great detail on looking at the valuation metrics of these different businesses 
businesses, the the debt to equity ratio, the EBITDA growth, the enterprise value to EBITDA growth. I mean, how many times did I say EBITDA in this article? It's probably probably like a hundred times. I think overall, you know, this article is great if you already know the company, you already know the space, you're already familiar with midstream pipeline companies, and you're trying to understand, you know is now it may be a good time to buy energy transfer. Is it valued competitively or fairly compared to others in its, you know, other peers, right? And so this article doesn't give any detail on, you know, the company itself, their competitive advantages, the moats, the mode of the company. And I think, you know, if you're, if you understand that, I think, uh, you know, the article is really great. Now, if you don't know anything about this company, you're going to want to go and research the company more, understand, you know, the ins and out of this business and try to understand, you know, what you're actually investing in. Because MLPs, BDCs, these are taxed differently. There was no, you know, the article doesn't discuss anything when it comes to taxes, but it's important to understand that these companies are not like investing into Coca-Cola, right, or PepsiCo. These are very, very different. There's different tax laws and codes that come into play when looking at these type of businesses. So just understand that. But overall, if you're familiar with the company, I thought the article was was well written, goes into very great detail in understanding how to value a, an MLP like Energy Transfer and its peers. But yeah, that's the article. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that the video was helpful. I hope that you learned something new and I'll see everybody in next week's video. Thanks for watching.